Is this is it recording? Yes, it is. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back to Coach Coach's Corner. It's been a minute, but the boys are back. And yeah, that's it. Damn straight. <laughs> all right. Um, so yeah, I guess we had a little bit of an absence there for a little while, but you know, all we were busy, busy, had a lot of stuff Tim, going on. Tim was learning how to swim. Blamed it yeah, on his kids. He blamed it on his kids. <laughs> Uh, but I'm very proficient at it now. I'm like a fucking, I'm like, I'm like a fucking fish. I'm like a frog that Steve has on his desk. But anyway, it only took me 40 years to get there. Um, questions. Who who wants to start? You want to start, Steve, or I'll start? You can start. Go ahead. All right. Let's see what we got here. Um, and guys, anybody that wants to ask questions in the chat, do so. Cause I only got a few today. And I have none because everyone sucks. I got a few too. I got a few as well. Um, Wait a second. I don't even know what this one says. I typed it in uh, horribly wrong. Oh, oh, this was two separate questions. Any new muscle building supplements on Amino Asylum that you recommend? And then in the second one, it said, or peptides and SARMs that you might recommend for muscle building specifically, I suppose. Um, I mean, I don't know about any peptides for muscle. I, that's the thing. It's like such a gray area because... I think people need to understand peptides aren't going to build muscle. Food food is going to build muscle. Calories are going to build muscle. So, or peptides that could help your food help you build muscle. Mm. Are we talking just off amino asylum? Yeah, I, to be honest with you, too, I'd have to go back in, which I can't do right now. I, I was I just going to ask male or female either. either so maybe we can cover. I honestly don't know. I had like three minutes to be able know. to write everything down, take a piss. With the peptides, man, I I mean, it depends. Again, the, the recovery ones, obviously, we're huge advocates for and stuff. But, I mean, I, look, you know, the carnitine, obviously, I'm big on. But, again, for the muscle building, oh, they have, like, that that monster pump, don't they, or something? I, mm -hmm. I know. Monster, mass monster. Mass, monster yeah, pump. I know that one works. I've, I've heard people. I've never personally used them. Um, but, um, but, yeah, I don't know. I'm curious to see what you, you say. I mean, I like the Mass Monster. I use it regularly. It's a, it is just a pump product essentially. Um, but it's it's one of those things where, um, you know, I I think that that's more of like a let's let's put it this way: if you're going to go injecting something into yourself, I would rather get something that's got a higher return on yeah, it. You know what I mean? I unless there's a reason, unless there's a reason why you're opting to go this route instead of asking about antibiotics. Again, no, I pro I could have messaged this person and maybe gotten more information behind it. But I would say in terms of peptides, honestly, the big things that you're going to look at as far as muscle growth is concerned there is going to be growth hormone, which again, I think that's even one of those ones where you have to understand that's a long-term application, you know, for the most part in terms of the benefits that we're getting there at muscle development. Um, otherwise, you know, great lipolytic agent. But again, from a muscle development standpoint, we're looking at growth hormone. Insulin eventually comes in there. Um, you know, and then again, things on Amino Asylum uh, website specifically, um, you know, Steve already mentioned carnitine, which has some real indirect benefits in terms of optimizing, you know, uh, uh, kind of like cellular function and trying to drive an environment that's most conducive to growth um, and, and, and they're staying lean at that time, too, which I think carnitine is really good for where it shines. But, um, you know, in terms of peptides on Amino Asylum. Um, and maybe we're focusing too much on amino uh, peptides specifically because he did ask any muscle building supplements on amino asylum. They do have a few things there that could be interesting. I just don't know of the um, long-term ramifications. Something like YK11 is one that I've actually messed with a little bit. That's a SARM. Yeah, I was going to uh, say the more, SARMs they have on there, I was going to say. Yeah, YK11 is interesting, though, where it's not a SARM. It's actually an active steroid, I think. And at the end of the day, that one's extremely potent. But we also don't know, you know too much about that long-term application and there's also been some anecdotal things there I, I don't know if this is actually research at all but with the uh, ligament health long term um I, i'll tell you right now the yk11 does make you fucking as strong as you like it's like reminiscent of cleanse super draw things like that in terms of the strength outputs but again i think a lot of those things um you know, we get so strong so quick that that's where we end up with a lot of issues as far as the ligaments are concerned or the soft tissues um, are concerned. So again, maybe an injury risk there. Uh, YK11 is reported to have like a higher uh, soft tissue uh, uh, injury concern. Um, again, I don't know if that's true or not. But outside of that, I don't know if there's any, there's Tressalone on there, which some people are big on. Um, I've never used Tressalone. I don't What's have any experience with it. It's, it's another uh, anabolic uh, steroid, but, um, and, and again, that's not a SARM, it's a direct anabolic, but again, I don't have any experience with that. I have no 
info behind that whatsoever, no experience with it whatsoever. So nothing that I would necessarily recommend there. Um, and again, I think for the most part to kind of where Steve was going a little bit beforehand, I think there's a lot of like secondary benefits from things that we can get on an amino asylum that are going to support muscle growth, whether it's metformin and, 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 and managing an internal environment where we can uh, uh, optimize, you know, carbohydrate use and, and, and blood glucose management, um, you know, maybe even things that are just going to generate a little bit more uh, positive benefits in terms of recovery, especially if you're a female like potentially things like CJC, ipamorelin. I don't think you, you don't really use that stuff. Do you, Steve? No. Yeah. Neither do we. We'll usually skip that and go right to growth hormone, but again, maybe some potential benefits there in recovery. Um, what are some other things on amino side that we definitely use to improve recovery? I mean, listen, I'm, I'm becoming even a bigger believer of BPC now for like gut health recovery. Yeah. There you go. BPC like, 157 TB 500. There you go. Huge. Yeah. Yeah, obviously for you right now with that, but that, that could yield some benefit too. I think we get so stuck in that with, again, the injuries and being able to recover from injuries, but that could have a lot of benefit in terms of reducing overall inflammation. inflammation. You guys both know how big I am on inflammation. Yeah. And trying to really bring that to a place where we know we are managing it the best we possibly can to get our best overall outcomes in terms of muscle growth, fat yep. loss, and just an overall healthy operative body. Um, to, to, to me, like it all starts and ends with inflammation. If we can keep inflammation at bay, we're usually going to have a much more productive uh, physiology or, or, or metabolism, um, et cetera. So, um, you know, definitely some interesting things with amino asylum. Can you think of anything, uh, Marina? No, but I will just add, I do to what you were just saying when you had me on TB 500 and what it was glutathione, I felt oh. like so fresh in the gym. So that's definitely yeah. a like secondary benefit. Yeah. Oh, I, I got no inflammation in my body right now. It was because she was. Yeah, I, said, exactly. I got, you're, you're, I got no inflammation. Yeah. I fucking have riddied my body of inflammation. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's, but it's also the recovery aspect for Steve right now is important. He just had a surgery and he's recovering at a fucking like ridiculous pace right now uh, with zero pain whatsoever. You didn't even take one pain bed so far, have you? But I didn't take ibuprofen or not. That's it. They could fuck all that, man. This shit's sitting up on the counter. Yeah. So, and, and again, with, with Steve, he's attacked it in every way, shape or form, whether it's the TB500, the BP157, a lot of the anti-inflammatories that we use that are over the counter. Um, so definitely a lot of potential there, I and think. A fuck ton of uh, obviously, training, yeah, college, it's, training is one of those things where you have to realize you are trying to drive inflammation to a certain extent to be able to elicit a specific outcome. But again, we always want to make sure that we understand there's a certain capacity and threshold for that until we're starting to go too high there. Um, Thomas asked, Tim, we spoke in the past, I go retired from competing, focusing on overall health and still holding Sounds like me right now. muscle, doable and thoughts. 100%. Yeah, I mean, obviously, listen, holding on to muscle, holding on to muscles we age is always something where we want to be mindful of all the, you know, crossing all our T's and dotting all of our I's. But as long as you're, you know, taking care of the two main things, right, that are going to maximize muscle protein synthesis, which is sending a response, sending a signal via training and say, sending a signal via food. You know what I mean? As long as you're taking in your protein on a consistent, regular basis, and obviously that's the chemical signal that we're sending to drive muscle protein synthesis. And then if you're training and you're sending that mechanical stimulus and driving muscle protein synthesis, you're usually going to do a pretty good job of holding on to a lot of quality muscle. And then like we were just talking about, maybe doing some other things to help reduce inflammation as you continue to age there to create an environment that's most conducive to sustain that muscle tissue, you're probably going to be in a pretty good spot overall yeah cool um what else you got it, why is your client using lemon juice on meals uh which is a post that's up right now in my stories i told riley's in peak week um actually he's he's two weeks out but we're mock we're mock peaking it right yeah, now so i'm just i'm just all it has nothing to do with lemon juice i just told him lemon juice was an option yeah for um, a condiment right or a whatever. yeah with that at that had essentially nothing in it. You know what I mean? So I was just trying to control sodium and potassium levels with a guy that desperately needs it. Um, he holds a lot of water. So we're just trying to manage the sodium intake as we bring up food a little bit, uh, which again, isn't something that we typically do. It's just with him specifically. And I just didn't want him having the extra sodium that I was gonna, getting for mustard or hot sauce. I was going to say too, just like a benefit too, is just like that, just help alkalining, like with alkalinity of the gut, especially this yeah. week and next week. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, there's no... Yeah, exactly. No reason why it can't be part of somebody's regular of process, uh, you know, on meals for different benefits. But at the end of the day, the whole that whole thing, there's again, there's a story in my in, on my on my IG right now about it. It's just it was nothing more than his particular plan on this particular day. That's it. It looks um, good. 
yeah, he looks good. We got to fill him up a little bit. Um, and uh, I think we're gonna, we have a little bit of a different plan this time around for peaking him. Um, and essentially I'm just going to fucking give him as much dye as I can fit in his little belly and fucking run him in there as dry as the fucking Sahara desert. But we'll see how long it lasts before he rebound. I'm just crossing my fingers and hoping he doesn't rebound by the night show. Um, nicotine for performance. And this is just a question. Never, that was literally the only question. Life. Uh, yeah, listen, I, I've used nicotine with clients plenty of times. I know I still have some clients on here that have used it before we used, uh, chewing the, um, gum. Nicorette. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The gum specifically. Um, and we would use it in, especially with natural federations where it was legal to, uh, help elicit more of a response in terms of fat loss. And there's definitely some research on nicotine and performance. Um, I'd have to find it. I'm not, I'm not familiar with it at this point, but uh, definitely something that I've looked at in the past. Uh, there's definitely benefits to any stimulant as it relates to uh, performance. Um, I, I don't know of the direct research, though, on nicotine performance. That's something I'd have to look up, uh, but I'm sure it exists. I'm sure it's going to help, just like I said, any stimulant will. Um, but I would always weigh the risk versus the reward there. You know what I mean? Um, how are we getting that nicotine? You know what I'm saying? I think there's so certain ways of getting that nicotine are more... Um, addictive i think nicotine in and of itself is obviously addictive but i think the way that you ingest it can ultimately make it more or less addictive as well um and obviously when we are doing it in ways like the zin pouches which is a really strong hit of nicotine three six and i think 11 milligrams now that's crazy high amounts of nicotine so you might even get more of a side effect causing down regulation and performance because you're starting to get an upset stomach a little dizzy things like that um so how you take that nicotine in i think is very important Smoking nicotine, uh, you know, is obviously just the oral fixation of it alone. It looks like I'm jerking off or sucking dick right now. But, uh, you know, it, but instead of holding the vape, you know, I'm holding the vape. But uh, the bottom line is that the oral fixation of smoking alone is something that's addictive, right? Um, Marina knows she's an addict and a half with it. But uh, the bottom line there is that that's why I used to rely on the little gums and we would get them at two milligrams and I'd have people break them in half and take one milligram in the AM, one milligram four to six hours later uh, with their fat burning stack to just kind of like elicit a little bit more of a response when it comes to fat burning. But I've never used it directly for performance enhancement in terms of the gym, maybe mental performance and or fat performance, but that's it. Yeah, I don't, to me, I, I have no say on nicotine at all. I've never used it. And then the last one I got here is any benefit to higher protein intake? I mean, I mean, there can be, but like, what are we, how, how high are we talking? I They didn't, it was just, a, it, that's exactly what they wrote down is any benefit to higher protein intake. And this person has messaged me before and actually asked me to do a video on protein intake specifically and it causing any issues as far as uh, like deleterious health impacts, like kidney function, gut health and all that different stuff. This is a while ago though. Um, I mean, you know, like, I mean, listen, at the end of the day, uh, we will bring people's proteins down in certain cases, right? <clears throat> like gut health issues, specifically in trying to drive up uh, digestive health there um, or, or or improve GI health. Um, I, I think sometimes protein can be overdone for sure. Um, I, it's not something that I see crazy uh, done, crazily done at this point where people, you know, like are given, you know, women the size of Marina 300 grams of protein a day. Um, I think obviously there's some scenarios where you might benefit a little bit more from higher protein. Um, and those scenarios most, most commonly, honestly, for the most general public would be, uh, you know, dieting phases where protein, even above a gram, gram per pound of body weight, you know, might be warded just to help control satiety and hunger. Um, but again, I think, you know, as far as muscle development is concerned, if that's what we're talking about here, you know, there really isn't a lot of support or evidence to show that anything over a gram per pound of body weight yeah. Um, is going to be majorly beneficial to growth. Now, that being said, we don't have a lot of research on bodybuilders taking steroids and the amount of protein uh, that, 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 you know, that would ultimately benefit them in terms of maximum outcomes. You know what I mean? Especially when we're talking about in contest prep and maybe a calorically deficient state and having higher levels of protein. So yeah. I think, I don't, I don't think anybody can say definitively there, but what I would say is, you know, bodybuilding isn't all about protein intake and building muscle. You know, it's also about performance in the gym. 
and other macronutrients can support that. Other macronutrients can support, you know, uh, whatever, cardiovascular function, reduced inflammatory or, or uh, healthier inflammatory response or anti-inflammatory response in this case, um, you know, insulin sensitivity, right? Like there's other benefits. So if we're driving so much of our overall caloric intake, which ultimately we have to be balanced in terms of calories with the goal that we have, if we're driving so much of that caloric intake to protein, is it going to take away from the other areas that we could maximize yeah. for muscle growth, fat loss, general health? Yeah, I was going to say that too. Like you got to look at everything as a whole, right? I've noticed even just with myself and clients too, like more protein, if anything, just runs, you run into a wall quicker. You run into... Um, not even from an insulin sensitivity standpoint, but appetite goes to shit quicker, appetite, yeah. bloating quicker, gut health goes to shit much quicker, right? So I found, like you said, Tim, like a, like if somebody say 200 pounds, having them at like 215, 220 grams, it's plenty plenty for recovery, plenty to support new tissue, but it keeps the gut at a, at a pretty good spot. I'd rather, and then, you know, see where their sensitivity is at, where their glucose is and stuff like that, whether it's fasting, What's up? Sorry, Vienna just walked in. Between meals, <laughs> after me, whatever, right? And then if you got to fill the calories, just fucking put up, start, start adding fats. You know what I mean? They're denser anyway, and you're going to get more bang for your buck if their sensitivities, like their glucose Higher quality levels, proteins ex- too. When you exactly. Add yeah. yeah. So yeah. I don't, I don't see the need anymore to start fucking killing somebody with protein. Like, you know what I mean? Like. One of the dudes doing big cat, he's 240. I have his protein at like 270. And he said at eight weeks out, it's the best his guts ever felt. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, I don't know. My last coach, I was eating like 12 ounces of meat per meal. Yeah. And now you only have me eating 175 grams, you yeah. know? So what yeah, you it's talk- one of those two where the, one of the main things that we see from a digestive complication standpoint or GI issue standpoints, mm. hello, hi, hi. hi. Uh, is gastric acid issues, right? And we're deficient in gastric acid production. uh, That our main thing is going to be complicated there is our breakdown of protein. So causing a lot of gas, a lot of bloating, and just having those meals feel like they're sitting in your stomach like a brick. I agree, dude. Yeah. Yeah, I I, My protein hasn't been much higher than 1.25 grams per body weight for years. And it feels fine. Yeah. What are you doing? Um, that's all I got. Are you okay. guys still getting questions on your end? Because mine stopped. I can't no, see anybody coming stopped. in. Okay. Um, um, I got no, a few, I, see any. I got a few questions. Uh, we bang these out real quick and then that's where we got to go. Um, what are your thoughts on oral only steroid cycles? You're not trying to build a lot of muscle. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's that. I, I would, I don't think personally I'd ever advise for them. I feel like you're going to run into a whole lot more shit than say you just want to run Anadrol or D-ball, for example, and, but you don't want to pin. Just fucking do a hundred milligrams of test a week in an insulin needle and you'll probably be fucking better off. You know what I mean? Running mm-hmm. than running into whatever you're going to run into just doing Anadrol or D-ball. You know, it's just in terms of side effects in side effects. Yeah. So I just yeah. don't I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. It's just you're limited in terms of the run that you're going to get. What you can and do, right. Yeah, the one thing I just had this conversation and duration with somebody, like, too. Yeah, I I just had this conversation with somebody where it's like, you know, can we take more during the off season to build more muscle and then compete again next year? And it's like, listen, you cannot. It doesn't matter if you're enhanced, if you're natural. Um, you know, it doesn't matter ultimately how many drugs you take. Definitely influences uh, almost in a linear fashion how much muscle you can build, without a doubt. But the problem with that becomes the toxicity side of things. Right. But the point that I'm trying to get to here is the reality that you can't get away from the amount of time that's necessary to build muscle. Right. Like it's going to cost you time at some point in your process, whether you're male, whether you're female, you know, it doesn't matter. Like at the end of the day, uh, you know, Marina has done, you know, oral only cycles to build muscle. We've been it's been a pretty efficient process so far. But the limitation there is we only have X amount of weeks on before we have to come off again to clean up those health metrics. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have to go back on and it just creates this, there's too many peaks and valleys. You yeah. know what I mean? Where it's like, you're more liable to lose some of that new tissue as you come off to clean up your health. Then you're going back on. And that initial few weeks of that uh, back on phase is really just getting back that volumization that we lost from coming off for a period of time. Right. So it's one of those things where at the end of the day, you'd want to have something that you can more consistently run over a longer period of time with less overall side effects. 
you know, is really what it comes down to. And to Steve's mm -hmm. point, even if you're taking a really low dosage of uh, 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 an ejectable, right, and taking it in something like a insulin syringe, it's a little bit more tolerable on a regular basis, you're probably going to get more overall results and be a lot safer and happier with the outcomes. Yeah. And I, I'm like, I told you this before, Tim, too, and I believe you are, we, you've agreed with me, you're bigger on microdosing now, right? Yeah. Well, uh, I think it all depends in an off season setting or like muscle growth setting. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I, yeah. So I actually know let me rephrase that in any setting, in any setting, it's just that sometimes in prep, we can't get away from the dosage just being fucking sky high. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So I noticed it's been about four months now since I switched from doing sauce to just test E and I was, I was microdosing the sauce and now I'm microdosing a test E. I noticed a massive difference in my anxiety with cutting the sauce out and doing testing, like a night and day difference just because of the peaks and valleys. So, um, I just, it's actually, actually crazy to, to see, cause I'm doing right now with the, with the knee, I'm just doing 50 a day. Mm -hmm. So, but I notice a massive difference, mood, sleep, and, and most of all my anxiety, like it's a night and day difference. Yeah. It's just a far more consistent thing. Crazy. Um, yeah. And the, uh, the sus really does. It makes like, I used to love sus. Don't get me wrong. Right. Um, and I understand why people do love it. It just, it doesn't make a lot of sense. We're talking about again, long-term application. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's see what I got. How do you manage blood glucose levels during meals? I noticed mine are spiking to over 100 after meals. So it I messaged this person and I was, I told them, I'm like, that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So I asked them where their fasting levels were, and he told me that they were at 85. And I said, it's still not bad. That's nice. I think there's something wrong with your blood glucometer if you're only going to 100 after. Yeah. You know, how, that's what I'm checking it. Is that like three hours postprandial? Because that's, you know, I, you're, I didn't you're, ask you're him, almost back to baseline. Yeah. So when I didn't ask him, like, what meal he was eating, how, carbs. Like, I didn't ask him any of that. I didn't get into his meal with him, but I asked him how soon after, and he said 30 minutes he was checking. And I it said to him, I, wrong. I said, that's low. I said, you, it should be higher. Yeah. Way higher. Yeah. And I, so I just told him, I'm like, listen, dude, like if it is, if there are, if it's much higher and there's a true concern, like you could just get a GDA, like that's, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. Or honestly, even fucking, you know, uh, a five minute walk after a meal, I know 10 minute oh, yeah, walk exactly. specifically has been shown uh, to help, uh, but that's been shown to, you know, um, decrease blood glucose by up to 30 percent in different I believe so it. you know that's a huge difference maker no. uh but again at the end of the day if your blood glucose is going to 100 post meal that means you're extremely efficient and insulin sensitive that's and, what i told uh, him like dude this doesn't sound like a problem to me this sounds like a a, a really good thing <laughs> like yeah mm -hmm. yeah that, so. that person should be pretty lean and if they're not then again, I, I would get know. a new blood glucometer because maybe that blood glucose uh, meter is fucked up. <laughs> um, my next one was, um, can you talk about insulin dosing and meal timing? So I'm assuming they mean, when do you take insulin in correlation to like how far after you eat a meal? Um, Depends so, on what insulin you're using. Yeah, so I was going to say, we need to talk about just humor a lot because one of the most used one. Well, I think Humalog is a very popular one, but I think honestly, for me, I usually use a medium acting one just because of the accessibility of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Novelin, you could just grow to fucking yeah, Walmart. And get it for bucks. So, so what do you do? You have somebody take it, and then I mean, they're obviously having the six to eight hour half life. So, do you have them take multiple dosages or? Yeah, sometimes it really depends on what their food intake is, right? So, like, right. at the end of the day, I'm using insulin based around the food consumption. So, like, I have a yes. client right now. She just started, um, you know, we, we we just got into an off-season phase where insulin and growth hormone are in play. And the thought process, like, well, when does the insulin come in? And I'm like, well, when food is high enough to need yeah. the insulin. So, do you, would you agree in. with the statement, Tim, that insulin needs to go around where your food is? is at and where it's going versus raising your food just to meet a higher insulin dose. Exactly. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. Because you know, some, um, you know, a lot of people that don't do that. <laughs> like people no, are just yeah, like, they, they I'm just taking insulin, take I'm insulin. taking 10 units and they just start fucking down in pop tarts and shit. Yeah. And that's where you end up getting fat from insulin and, or the blown out gut. I was going to say or, your stomach fucking just for different things. Yeah and, yeah. and also too, you just fucking, you're going to fuck your insulin sensitivity up quick. Yeah. 
and realistically, if you're if you're taking the right amount of insulin, you don't need as many carbs to be able to cover that insulin of course. as I think a lot of people, you know, uh, have 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 kind of portrayed or, or or kind of think that they might need. And people right. are so afraid of going hypo. It's like, you know, if I'm giving somebody insulin peri workout specifically, we're not talking a long acting insulin, which right. is another option here. A long acting insulin is a lot easier to control. Right. Um, and, and it's definitely going to be in play, obviously, longer throughout the course of the day to help manage multiple different meals and keep that blood sugar more stable consistently. But if we're talking around a peri workout nutrition to be able to really drive nutrition um, at a particular time, then, you know, ultimately the, 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 the program should be set up that way where it's like, you know, hey, we're having a pre-workout meal. We're having something intra-workout potentially yeah, and post. then something post-workout. Yeah. And all, if we're starting with just a pre-workout dosage, that should be a dosage that covers you know, and when I say covers, of, of I mean, interest. right. It, so it, it, it's a dose that's small enough to where we don't need to worry about yeah, going crazy, going hypo. And and, yeah, 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 exactly. You never training. have to worry about going hypo. Yeah. So yeah, the only time I'm going to add that post workout serving is when we've like food has gotten elevated to that point where it's yeah. like now it's a necessity. Yeah. So that's it's what I'm at with, with Matt, who who won Big Cat last year. So, like his mm -hmm. food, you know, we, we cleaned him out, we lowered, he, we dropped about 15 pounds. And then now his food's back up. And we have him doing, um, I have him at five units pre, and then I have him doing, he's doing, I think I have him at 110 carbs pre, he's doing 60 carbs during, and that is obviously five units. Th those carbs are covering that more than, more than enough. So he's fine. And then I have him doing an immediate post-workout shake with rice cakes. So I have him doing 40 grams of isolate with five rice cakes, and then he's doing five units of Humalog at his post-workout meal, the next meal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, Which is yeah. just a fuck ton of rice and chicken. Yeah. The one fruit. thing I would say, as far as the insulin is concerned, is, you know, it's one of those things where I feel like when it's used well enough, again, we were just talking about long-term muscle development strategies, essentially, right? Yeah. Um, and it's like, to me, that's one of those things where it's like, you know, you could really get a lot out of that over a long period of time when it's used the right way. Oh, uh, but yeah. I, I see I see a lot of people here recently, and this is just recent now, talking about how bad insulin and growth hormone are now because of wastes and guts and you know, well, abuse that we see. Again, yeah, 100 percent. That was my point. That's where I was going with. Like if yeah. you abuse it and you do exactly like we were just talking about where. You know, maybe you maybe you're checking your blood sugar, right? And your blood sugar every morning is like 120. And now your dosage of you know long acting insulin and you know short acting insulin around your training session has to go up because you can't keep that. You have to look at what else am I doing? I taking fucking eight units of growth a day, and am I reacting to that growth in that way where it's like I'm driving this and I'm trying to cover it now with insulin? Of course, you're, you're you know there's potential for additional growth there that we don't want to see. Um, and or am I pushing such an amount of food? that I'm seeing this dysregulated blood glucose where now I have to cover it with all the, of this insulin. Like at a certain point, insulin probably has a number that shouldn't, shouldn't need to be eclipsed. And if you're eclipsing that particular number, which again, it's going to be different per, per protocol, per how big somebody is, what level they're at, right? But especially in your initial phases of, 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 of growth hormone insulin, Nate, like who, you shouldn't necessarily on, need more than you like 10 units of long acting insulin a day and or five to 10 units of a short acting insulin around training, even 10 units of short acting insulin around training is a decent bit, right? Like you should be somebody that has a good amount of appreciable muscle at that time. Um, so again, it's one of those things where if you're using appropriate dosages, you know, it could have a ton of benefit uh, to be able to drive long-term anabolism and not have to worry about as many side effects as we might have to with long-term androgen usage. Now Sorry. Fucking Vienna is going nuts on the stairmaster. She's trying, dude. She's climbing it, trying to turn it on now. Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! I'm, I'm like Nina. You gotta get her. <laughs> like, oh, uh, okay. What else do we got? I have two, two more. Uh you want the food one first or the steroid one? Uh, Go steroid uh, one since you're kind yeah, of on steroid. it. All right, craziest cycle you guys have ever seen. Oh, Tim, you showed me one. one. Yeah, recently. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty recently. sure me and Tim, Tim, though. Yeah, I think we're all on the same page. Yeah. yeah. Can we say it? I guess, right? Not, obviously, we won't be specific. Yeah. So we've all recently seen it where, um, you know, we've seen women on literally hundreds of milligrams of testosterone. I think it was 300 milligrams of testosterone, right? 
Well, the one, so the one, the one yeah, was multiple different types. The of one was option. on, the one was on 300 a week. Um, and that was, but there was two, two different tests though. Wasn't it? Wasn't yeah, it? It was, it was yeah. also Sassanon, right? Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. one was sus. The other one was just 300 milligrams of test sip. And her doctor told her that was TRT or somebody told her in the gym or some shit. That was TRT. Yeah. 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 That was a different one, but, yeah. um, and then we 300 milligrams of trend we've seen in a female cycle. Um, and that's on top of a whole bunch of other shit. I mean, we're just scratching the surface there. Like that's, oh, you know, we're talking irresponsibility. So think, yeah. That's, that's, that's one of the worst ones I've ever seen without a doubt. Um, but I, I mean, honestly, I've, we've also seen it and we've talked about it on the podcast multiple times where I've had somebody come to me running obscene amounts of trend. I have a client right it now that came to us from this podcast. Sustanon, they came trend, to Mastron, us. Aromacin, Proviron, Clengy H. Yeah. So, but I, I've also seen somebody come to us from this podcast who's actually a really good client. Uh, just didn't I, I, like, you know, didn't know what they were doing. Was running 500 milligrams of um, trend. Was running whatever it was, like I think 750 milligrams of test, but then a shit ton of orals on top of that, some Mastron on top of that, and it's like you know some of the dosages individually, like the Mastron wasn't that bad at 400 milligrams, but all told the dosage was like 1.7. And then they came to me eating 1200 calories a day. Oh, and shit. it's like, you know, we're, yeah. We're, so when you're putting it in perspective in terms of some of the worst cycles you've ever seen, like that to me would be a horrible cycle just based off of a, some of the dosages with particular compounds, but then also the environment that you're creating. It's like, what the fuck is the point of that? Like mm -hmm. you're legitimately just doing it for a cosmetic benefit. You know, you're not really growing at that pace. And like, at the end of the day, you're probably far exceeding the limit that you need for that cosmetic to the point where you're just driving toxicity afterwards, yeah. you know? So yeah, I would say most all the shitty cycles that I've seen though do do uh, surround themselves with um, either too trend much usage tests. and too well, much. I would tests. say trend. Yeah, oh, trend. trend. Well, yeah, trend. yeah, for sure. And then honestly, I've seen a lot of fucking SARM abuse. A lot of SARM abuse. I have too. Right. I've just where heard it's like of guys. It. Yeah. Well, I have. I have. I have somebody in particular I can think of where he would always, always want to run the SARMs, right? And they'd always be on top of everything else. So we'd be running like whatever you know, 400 milligrams of DECA, 600 milligrams of EQ, 750 milligrams of test is his base cycle. But then he's taking like, you know, whatever, every storm, that, you know, fucking rad this and fucking LGD that and carterine this and all these little things on top of it uh, to where it's like, dude, why are we even like that? To me, it's just abuse where it's like, what are you going to get out of that? Like you read, you read a cool article online and you think it's going to give you the, all, but is it really making any difference over 750 milligrams of test? 400 milligrams of deco or 600 milligrams of eq like no. where are we going with this too yeah. much yeah all right my last one i got was how much do you how do you know how much to refeed a client on a refeed day it's a good question i was just i was just talking about this with riley yeah you so start, you want to go on that one yeah so obviously when it gets to that point right say in a, we'll take a prep right for for example because um, that's when we're going to obviously use them the most, I'd say, right, for the benefit of, of what they're intended to do. So I would say it really depends. First, the coach determines when they are needed. Right. And then where's your where's their current food at? Right. Where's their current sensitivity? What what's the purpose of that high day? Is it to give them a diet break because they're telling you they're being run into the ground? Or is it. To, to start testing how full they get after one, two, three, whatever, how many days the coach decides to do it. Um, is it, are we doing this weekly, you know, a weekly one, two day thing to crank the metabolism more and drop the cortisol. Um, typically I will start just doubling their carbs. You know what I mean? And see what, see what response that gives us. Right. So if their carbs are 150, let's try and get them to 275 to 300. And let's just see what it does. If they hold, you know, that you might be able, able to, do that for two days, three days. And if they hold or they even drop after a day or two of that, you know, it's it working and you might even be able to increase their base diet. Um, you know, so for example, like right now at big cat, everybody's seven and a half weeks out and they're all on a pace for one to two high days a week at this point. And every single person's gotten a diet break, you know what I mean? So, I mean, some of them are two times over still, some of them are one and a half times over where their carbs are at. Some are right now, two and a half times over, you know what I mean? So, and then some are getting, then you have to look at fats, right? Where, you know, where are their fats at? And, you know, are they, are they holding after one high day or two high days? And then 
where are you going to place fats at to, to have the food stick a little bit longer so they don't start, you know, fucking depleting too fast and stuff like that. So it's, it's a very complex situation. Yeah, I, I would say when you're initially thinking refeeding, right, when we're talking about any dieting strategy, let alone prep is a little bit more uh, significant in terms of the severity that you're going to run into in terms of the depth of the diet, and right. then ultimately in terms of the sensitivity that you have. So, you know, just taking dieting as a whole here, for me, I'm a little bit more conservative when it comes to some of the refeeds, especially initially with a client. Like, I'm probably looking at maybe like a 20% increase in total caloric intake. And yep. again, to Steve's point, most of that's going to come from carbohydrates. Yep. Now, that, to me, what it does is it allows me to not overshoot somebody when the goal is ultimately fat loss. You know what I mean? So, yep. like, I don't want to overshoot somebody and then ultimately drive an outcome where it's pulling us out of that fat loss phase, especially when maybe they're not ready for that. And I'm just testing it. We haven't seen how, how well they react to it. Um, so again, I'm looking at, you know, as Steve brought it up already, the diet break concept where it's like, it's just a diet break is essentially just an extended refeed. Right. Um, so for me, it's like, I'd rather have a lighter refeed over a longer period of time right. than have a heavier refeed over a shorter period of time, unless we're talking specifics when it comes to bodybuilding and trying to get a particular outcome in terms of that look right. on the stage. Then obviously we might need to refeed somebody aggressively in a really short window pre-stage, depending on what's going on there with, with, with weight caps and all that stuff. And stuff. But uh, again, I, I would say the easiest way to think about that um, and if we're putting a, a a specific number to it, which I'm saying 20%, I'm just using it as a ballpark. I don't really do percentages. I'm using my eye and just fucking go. But I would say that's as conservative as I get there, right? Like a 20% increase in calories. And again, most of that, um, if not all of that, in some cases, just going straight to carbohydrates. And then again, to C's point, run that for a day. What's the response? You know, did we lose weight, gain weight, stay the same? And then if we stayed the same or lost weight, we're going to go again because obviously we didn't load any glycogen back. And then we'll go again until we do start to see some sort of loading glycogen. And then what is that load? Is it just a pound or two? I'm okay with that. Let's run it again. Did we gain another pound or two or did we stay the same? You know what I mean? And then obviously you have your limit in terms of how far up you want to go. And then boom, it's right back down to dieting. Um, and essentially, you know, in most cases, we will see a little bit of an uptick metabolically there and maybe a new low uh, pre uh, preceding that. Uh, but I, I would also say, two factors that I take into consideration when I, when, when I'm thinking refeeding and how much I'm going to refeed somebody is how much muscularity do they have? I'm not going to give 120, fa 120 pound female, you know, or, or, or less in some cases, um, you know, if it's not overly muscular, a substantial refeed, like it's right. just probably not going to happen again. I might give them that 20% intake. I might give that over three or four days versus a male that's 200 pounds lean and shredded, you know, them, I might be able to give them a fucking 40% increase in calories right, right. or something large over a shorter window of time to really fill them out and drive up performance and rinse of fatigue. Yep. So, and then the other thing too, is I, I have a lot of people that are just, uh, I don't really know the, the terminology here. You know, there's endomorphic, ectomorphic, and mesomorphic. I don't know which one the fat person is, but whichever one that one is, the, the, I think the meso, fat body type. Meso. Mesomorph. Meso, so yeah. if, I, if I have a true mesomorph, uh, and maybe they've gotten into good shape, right, over time, but they're still, they, they have those mesomorphic tendencies where they're just always going to be that bigger person, right? Um, and hold on to a little bit more body fat, a little bit more water, a little bit more uh, of, of that uh, extra tissue there. I, I would just say, with those people, I'm very, very careful. Like I have a guy I can think of right now off the top of my head. He's in a full blown off season growth mode and he still is cycling uh low, medium, high day. So it's literally yeah. a low, medium, high cycle all the way through. So he still has a low day in his plan. We're talking about a guy that's 240 pounds. And again, he's well muscled. He's not just all body fat, but he has those mesomorphic tendencies still. When I right. got him, he was pretty much. Uh, no, endo endomorph is the thicker one. All right. So the endomorph. Um, right? But again, yeah. he was very, very much the Pillsbury Doughboy when I first got him. We carved him into something pretty, pretty decent. Um, and now, though, he still has those endomorphic tendencies to where yeah. if we give him too much food, he blows the fuck up. Like Man, I can increase crazy. his calories by 20 percent. He'll gain four pounds. Next yeah. Day. So cycling him is carb cycling him is way more efficient. Yeah, 100%. He's got to be cardio year round. He's carb cycled year round at this point, you know, even when we're on extensive amounts of androgens. Um, and at the end of the day, it's working well for him. So, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, that makes a situation like that makes total sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, so, you know, some of the girls that like Marina's posing for Big Cat, for example, right? Like before they started getting refeeds, they were at, easily out of at dropping like one to two pounds a week, right? And then mm -hmm. I'd say probably around 10, 11, 12 weeks, we started getting the, the one day a week, but say that, for example, say their carbs were like 130, 140 at that point, the, the first high day for all of them, their carbs only went to like 185, you know what I mean? And then now some of them are at like 220, 230 because, um, and now they're at like, you know, 
the one just I refed her over the weekend and I was telling Marina before we got on, like I had to refeed her because she dropped a pound after Saturday at 240 carbs. And I told her on Sunday on an off day, run the same day. Mm -hmm. I was like, just same pre and post, but just run the same day. And she literally has held her weight beautifully even into today, which is awesome. So I just cut food a little bit again and I reduced her cardio though, as I cut the food. So I told her like by this weekend, when we refeed again, you'll be at a new low. I'm a hundred percent confident in that. Mm -hmm. But that's also why you work with your coach on that, because at the end of the day, you're also talking about a girl that I was just talking about where they're lower in body weight. They're relatively young. So they don't have a ton of, 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 of mature tissue, but at the end of the day, they're also genetically gifted. Like they're freaks, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But you know, you have two clients right now that look amazing. They look like they've been you. for a long time. Yeah. And at the end of the day though, you wouldn't know that until you've pushed it until you tried it yeah. and when you do it strategically you do it methodically like you figure out what that upper threshold is you know what i mean which yeah. is ultimately only going to maximize tissue maintenance over a long deficit right and down regulate or attenuate some of the side effects that we see with dieting that's what i say and then like you know she she texted me yesterday she's like i feel fucking amazing and i'm like well yeah you just ate 450 carbs over two days and you weigh 109 pounds like you should feel fucking amazing <laughs> you know yeah, what i mean yeah. and, and then now we today i started driving her into the ground again Back so, to it. I'm like, that's just how it is, right? We 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 drop cortisol, we drop stress, chill the fuck out. And I and I cut her cardio by a lot too over the refeeds. You know, like Sunday she had no cardio at all. It was a full rest day with with 240 carbs. Yeah. And I even increased some of her fats, and she's holding into today with still some fullness. Um, you know, it's, it works well. There oh, she is. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't. I try to explain to people like. When it's a situation like that, you can't ask for a better fucking situation. Like when you're getting two high days a week at seven and a half weeks, eight weeks out and a full, and you've already had a full diet break and you're still fucking dropping. Like she's six pounds down from a diet break two weeks ago. It's like, you can't ask yeah, for more. You, you can't ask for that. You have to work for it. And that's what, that's what that, I mean. But comes, like I'm saying, yeah. you work your ass off for that. And now I told her you're in a, a fucking, a, a, she, me and Marina just said she could literally be on stage in two weeks if I needed to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's one of those ones where it's like, that's built over a long time of like putting yeah. in the effort and the work and many months of just grinding away. That's what it is. Yeah. Yep. 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 Again, what do we always say? The off season is when shit's won, right? It's just yep, yep, the exactly. fucking truth. You know what I mean? Now is just, now it's just suffering to put the fifth, you know, the final touches and see what's under there. So, yep. um, but that was all I had. Um, cool, yeah, cool, cool. Same. I'm all out. They were good questions though. Yeah. Yeah. Quickie one. Um, I've had enough coffee and stimulants that we went through that really quickly. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't I even know the last time I had caffeine then. I've, I've had enough caffeine today for the both of us. How much? Uh, I think I've had like four cups of coffee. Um, Couple, couple little extras here and there. You know what I mean. A you know the, nicotine. the last time I had coffee was when I did Junior USA's three years ago. I am uh, I'm running on E, Steve. I'm running on E, and I got a plan due by end of night tonight, and I gotta get on a phone call with this bitch afterwards to be able to go over two plans that she has too. Which bitch? It's the only bitch here. Oh, okay, that's the head bitch in charge. <laughs> the eight, yeah, I was gonna say the H I B C. Is that what H B I C? <laughs> um, all right. Let me That's sign us off. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you everyone for listening. We will catch you guys next week. Bye.